right guys, how's it going? Hope you guys are great. We are back again with some more, the one only Bob. This is a longer book, so it's taken us a little longer to get through, but I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. Um, we read last time that the tornado that spun off of the hurricane that was happening, it has hit. And just as it was hitting, Bob was trying to get back to Julia. George was telling Julia, run, it's starting to hail, it's coming. And Bob, he's walked this wall between Ruby and Ivan a thousand times and never had a problem, but for whatever reason he slipped, he fell into Ivan's enclosure. And all of a sudden, all he hears is all of this noise, everything's being torn apart, and he realizes that he is flying. He is airborne and he sees all of this um, rubble and trash and um, umbrellas and tree, just bits of trees, everything just flying everywhere while he's up in the air in this tornado. He ends up landing in the giraffe enclosure and he starts realizing that his first thought is not about his people. He's not worried about Ivan or Ruby or Julia. That's, that's what a hero dog would do, but he's saying he's not a hero dog. He is more worried about himself and he starts howling, you know, like a newborn puppy. Um, he's not hurt, but he starts wandering around and kind of checking on things. And so that is where we are at now. So this is called <clears throat> Baby Sloth. <clears throat> I say goodbye to the penguins and continue on my way. So much has simply vanished. Walls, fences, barriers, netting. The orderly world of the park with its careful lines defining territory isn't so defined anymore. Many of the habitats are still entirely intact, but not all. What will this place be without fences and walls? You didn't need to watch the Nature Channel to know that certain animals like to eat certain other animals. I pass two squirrel monkeys swinging happily from the children's carousel. A pelican watches from her perch on a popcorn stand. I see a camel and a zebra together, looking stunned to be standing side by side. I notice a red lemur, Merlin, on a picnic table. Lemur eyes are always big if you ask me, but Merlin's eyes look like they were about to pop out of his head. I make my way through splintered wood and glass shards and approach the gift shop. It's roofless. Stuffed toy animals are scattered here and there like they try to make a break for it. An I love koalas t-shirt dangles from a tree branch. Around the corner I see a baby sloth, Sylvia. I think her name is. She's resting on a muddy plush giraffe. Hey there, I say. She makes a tiny noise. A sloth sob, I guess. Let's find your mom and dad. I'm not one for hugging and licking and such, but I give her a little nudge with my nose. Sylvia somehow manages to grab the giraffe and looks up at me like she expects to hitch a ride. How the heck do you pick up a baby sloth? It's not exactly part of my job description and sloths are so, you know, slothy. Carefully, I pick her up by her scruff the way you do with a puppy. She puts that silly toy in her mouth and off we go. Takes a few minutes, but I find her mom, Selma. I deposit Sylvia on the patch of wet grass. Oh, how can I thank you, Selma cries. No biggie, I say, and I head on, with fear in my belly and the odd taste of sloth fur in my mouth. Ugh. Make no sudden moves. I've ridden around the grounds of the park in Julia's backpack enough to know every inch of this place. I've even chatted with many of the residents, but now everything is topsy-turvy. I keep finding myself in places that I don't want to be. like the wolf exhibit. Near the entrance, a sign lies crushed on the ground. It has a picture of a gray wolf on an arrow pointing one way and another arrow with the emperor penguin on it. To my right, I see a piece of hay stuck deep in a tree trunk like a pencil and a cupcake. To my left, water gushes from a pathside ditch, a broken pipe. The boiling sky has settled into a solid blanket of gray and the rain's quieted to a steady drizzle. Still, I smell more bad weather menacing in the distance. Tossed into a bush is a large informational display with a photo of two gray wolves. I don't see any fence or barrier or intact wall. And it dawns on me that grumpy wolves and tiny dogs might not make the best of pals, especially under these trying circumstances. 
Just as I start to leave, a wolf on the sign seems to move, to blink. Ugh, he isn't part of the sign. He's next to the sign. It's Kimu. Hey, I say. No answer. Something tells me I should hightail it out of there. Something else is saying, make no sudden moves. I hate it when my brain disagrees with myself. I split the difference, crouching meekly, doing the whole submissive dog thing. Kimu locks his eyes on me. I try not to make direct eye contact. A lot of animals find that threatening, but his eyes are mesmerizing, glowing amber and way too smart. He moves again. Two paws appear. <clears throat> Big paws. Nothing like my feeble, shrimpy feet. These paws are the size of hamburger buns. Hamburger buns with lethal claws attached. Mutt versus wolf. I wait for him to launch into his pounce. Maybe if I time my escape just right. Yeah, sure, in a battle of Chihuahua mutt versus wolf, even I wouldn't bet on the dog. Do they break your neck before they eat you? That only seems fair. My heart is doing this crazy tap dance on my chest and I wonder if he can hear it. I sneak a peek at him. Strangely, he just keeps staring at me. Quickly, I avert my gaze. Those eyes, those chilling, dangerous eyes. It, it's me, Bob, I say. Kimu says nothing. He is panting hard. Maybe, maybe he's disoriented or maybe he's even hurt. I try to speak again. My voice seems to be hiding somewhere deep in my throat. Another try. Um, Kimu? He blinks. Are you, are you all right? No response. Is anyone else hurt? I ask. This time he seems to hear me. I don't know. His voice is super low. Can, can I help? I ask, really hoping the answer's no. S Suzu, Suzu, I, I can't find her. All right then, I say, I'll, uh, I'll take a look. I poke around a bit, careful not to get too close to Kimu. Sour smell pours off of him like sweat off of a human. I don't, I don't see her, I say, after a few minutes. But I'm sure she's fine, just a little shook up probably, hiding somewhere. He doesn't answer. I, I should go, I am I'm looking for some friends, I say. Is there anything else I can do? He looks up at the ominous sky as if there's an answer waiting. I don't know, he says. I don't know, I, I don't know. Gorilla world. I move on. I have to find my friends. I have to. But where am I? I leap over another mangled signpost with bent arrows, one way to Reptileville, one way to Lionland. I pass the mangrove swamp. A manatee pokes up her big head draped with Spanish moss like a silly wig. There. Two workers in yellow raincoats trot past me. One has a bloody bandage on his cheek. I need to stop and regroup. Cool it, Bob, I tell myself. I'm panicking. I'm not taking in the right data. I try to blot out all the horrible smells and all the awful noise. I concentrate and let my nose do the real work. A whiff of something familiar. Gorilla? It has to be gorilla. Full run now, I cut my back left paw on a shard of glass, trip, and I fall hard on my nose, and I cut it too. Dripping blood, I carry on. Find them, find them, find them. A massive old oak lies on the side, the entrance to Gorilla World. Huge, tangled roots grope into the air like frozen snakes, and just beyond where Ivan lives is nothing but devastation. Help us! The stone wall separating Gorilla World and Elephant Odyssey is gone. Pieces of both domains mingle. An elephant toy here, a gorilla nest there. Part of the indoor gorilla space has crumbled to the ground. I scan the area where Ruby and her herd like to hang out. Nothing. No gorillas either. Out of nowhere, the rain picks back up, coming in sideways, blinding me. The wind howls like a hurt dog. This storm isn't over, not by a long shot. I leap over a pile of cement blocks, catch my hurt foot on something sharp, and I yelp, but I keep going. Ivan, I call, Ruby! <coughs> Excuse me, nothing. I get a slight rise, leap onto another overturned tree and try to make sense of all this damage. Red and blue lights cut through the rain, police, fire engines, good, we need all the help we can get. I take in several lungfuls of this Hideous air. It's too wet, too full of conflicting odors, a mishmash of scents I can't decipher, especially with my busted nose. The wind gathers speed, pushing me with incredible force. 
Feels like it'll tear my ears right off my sore noggin. I can barely stay upright. Wind like that, storm wind, doesn't carry scent. It obliterates it. Help, help us! It's a, a tiny, desperate voice. Maybe even Ruby's voice. Kudzu. I pick my way through the debris, trying to lock on the sound. It ain't easy. Please help us. Climbing over the remains of the wall, the one I was sitting on, when what seems like moments ago, I find myself at the bank of the moat. Ruby! I call at the top of my lungs. Uncle Bob! The sound of my name cuts through the gloom like a shaft of sun. Ruby runs to the opposite edge of the water. She may be eight feet away, but I can barely make her out in this torrential rain. You stay there, I yell, trying to be heard over the wind. I'll come to you. I follow the bank until I come to the spot where several chunks of wall have tumbled into the water. Three careful leaps and I'm across. Ruby runs to greet me. She wraps her mud-coated trunk around my neck and boy, oh boy, am I happy to see that sweet little elephant. Are you hurt, Ruby, I ask? Is everyone all right? Ruby snuffles, yes, but, but come quick. She dashes off before I can ask anything more. Five of Ruby's ants stand by the elephant's side of the moat. Each one has her trunk plunged deep in the water. They look like a bunch of kids trying to find a lost toy in a swimming pool. It's almost funny until I see what they're reaching for. A baby gorilla is in the moat. The tiny gal keeps grabbing for a trunk to hold onto and slipping free. Her terrified screeches fill the air. It's Kutsu. It's Ivan's favorite. An idea. Going in says Masika, one of the younger ants. Oh, it might make things worse, Akelo cautions. Displace the mud, pull her down to the bottom? I could go in, I suggest, the words popping out before I can actually swallow them. It's more mud than water, Bob. You'll get stuck just as cuts you. I don't exactly argue the point. I have an idea, comes a small voice. All the aunties turn to Ruby and she looks startled to have their complete attention. A couple of us get on the other side of the moat, Ruby says. Grab trunks. We'll make like a, what do you, what do you call it? A sling, I say. A hammock, like, like the gorillas have. I don't know, Ruby. Akello sounds doubtful. Katsu grabs for Masika's trunk with both hands. Wait, Masika says. I, I think I've got her this time. Masika lifts her trunk with deliberate slowness, carefully trying to support the baby gorilla. But once again, Katsu can't hold on and she lets out a despairing cry. Down she goes. Lower this time, her nose and eyes just barely visible. Okay, Akalo says with a nod at Ruby. Let's give Ruby's idea a try. Masika, Laheli, Elodie, cross over the far side. Zena, Ruby, and I will take this side. All three elephants move with surprising quickness to the spot where I crossed. They gallop back until they're facing us. It's strange to see them on the other side of the moat. With the wall destroyed, they're technically in Ivan and Kenyani's domain. Move down just a bit, Akelo instructs that way. She motions with her head. We want to scoop her out, not push her down. Three on one side, three on the other. The elephants reach out for each other's trunks, creating a kind of cradle. Okay now, says Akelo. Lower, carefully. Down they go into the muddy water. Ruby nearly loses her footing, so I grab her tail with my teeth. It doesn't really help, and she yelps, ouch! But my heart's in the right place. Katsu thrashes her tiny arm. Stay calm, I call. Easy for me to say. She looks over at me and I will never forget the fear in her eyes. Then she vanishes below the surface. Okay, we're gonna stop there. We will start on the next chapter tomorrow. Bye guys.